Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to just take this off so I, I don't walk away from it. Uh, that There was a little mistake in that video. I don't know if you caught it, but it's kind of fun for me to show that version. It's the only version I, I had that video made. Somebody made it for me. and. Um, it's, uh, it was playing in the middle of the night, and, and I'll, ta I'll speak to it a little later, but it's, uh, it's a, kind of, a kind of funny version because it has me actually on the inner, and the inner lane was winning. So you know, it's the only time I'll win a gold medal at the Olympics when I kind of virtually won it because Steve Armitage said I did. Anyway, um, this is uh, my kind of group to speak to. It's, I, I did a talk a couple months ago to a, a group of activity leaders, but it's rare when I get to speak to activity leaders focused on girls in sport and activity and it's shocking a little to me how few times I've been asked to actually speak on the subject. Um, that being said, I'm not an expert on the subject other than uh, I was a successful female athlete so I have parents who obviously did something right with me and, and I'm a mother to three girls who are all active in sport. Um, but they're a bit of an experiment going on right now because they're just a small sampling. So um, please don't take all of what I say as, as uh, you know, studied experiments. It's, it's kind of my experiences and, and um, fun for me to think about and, and fun for me to put to practice, obviously, with my kids. Um, I, uh, I speak mostly to um, dreams and the kind of opening of doors that people in your life can make. And I always wondered why that video or that sort of my dad's one message. I mean, my dad was a dad in the, in the 70s, working all the time, gone most of the time, took an interest in sports with the kids, but was busy, right? He was a great dad, but super busy. My mom was always there. but. And I, I wonder sometimes if my mom feels a little kind of jealous that her words didn't stick out in my brain as much as my dad's were, words did. But um, parents in general obviously have huge influence on kids and their uh, travels through activity and sport. Um, but I, 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 my kids went to Balmoral Hall. My, all three girls went to Balmoral Hall for a few years and we had constant parenting um, sort of evenings, there were messages all the time about the benefits of girls in all girls um, sort of environments. And a woman named Joanne Deet came and spoke to us once and it just sticks out in my brain, a lot of things that she said stick, stick out in my brain, but one was that girls, especially adolescent girls, that between 10 and 18 is when you're, all kids, your self-esteem goes up to about 10, and then s girls start to plummet. Boys kind of stay about the same. Um, but in adolescence, girls tend to hold on to every word their fathers say. Boys, not as much. And girls, white noise is what they hear from their moms. So, you know, if, <laughs> if you ever uh, wonder why your teens are glazing over um, once they, you know, in their 10 to 18 years, uh, it's, it's because they do. They just hear ma, 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 ma. So get your husband to say the words, or, or for you dads out here, um, be the ones who say those messages. Make sure that you tell your kids in general, parents in general, that they can be great and that there is nothing stopping them. So dreams are, are made often by our parents, but often by our activity leaders, like all of you, um, coaches, friends, whatever, uh, we need to give that message out all the time. So when my dad said that to me, when he said, you can do anything you want to do, it opened the door not only to me being an aspiring person, but I, I really, I don't think at that time I really understood what the Olympics were. That would have been in 1976, probably in the fall on our way home or to, from a speed skating practice. I remember where the car was driving, we were trying to go over um, the Henderson Highway <laughs> overpass is not a big overpass to go over, but slippery in the in the winter for our little green bug, and 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 I can remember it so clearly because it just stuck to me. And my dad said, "You can do anything you want to do." Now, can you imagine what would happen if all girls, all kids, heard those messages? We'd have these people 
that aspire, that their brains become open to the possibility. And, and really, that's what happened to me that day. Um, Self-esteem is something that, and this Joanne Deke spoke about as well, but it's something that gets built uh, through, and I believe this wholeheartedly, that it's three things. Connectedness, competence, and confidence. So girls, and this is, this is her speaking as well, so I'm going to just go off of some of the things I learned from her. It's really interesting, but uh, they've done experiments on girls and boys, babies, and about 80% of boys, when they, they've been given something and then it's been taken away, get mad. They get frustrated and mad. About 20% of the boys cry. Um, and these are like eight-month-old babies. So they're not, they don't have a ton of an environmental impact on them yet. Um, about 80% of the girls that get those things taken away from them cry. And about 20% of those girls get mad. So we have to listen to some of that. So, most, so that 80% of those girls get born with connectedness. Connectedness is a big reason why, you know, and please don't uh, take this the wrong way, but when we see big sort of things happening in schools, the, connect, the boys that aren't connected and uh, attached to their environments sometimes can act out, right? So girls, it doesn't happen as often with girls, but girls have connectedness, but they don't always have that um, confidence that comes from competence. So there's, and I believe this 100%, that we need to push our girls more past the point of fear. So I, I you know, I was raised by German parents. My dad was an immigrant. He had hope in us. He was quite, um, they, my parents both, were quite, you know, uh, not pushing us in sport because they were very shy, um, but pushing us in attitudes. So if you started the season, you finished the season because we paid our money for that and you're not getting out of it. Um, and so what that did was not allow us to kind of quit on a whim, which I think is super important for kids. kids. Kids from day to day love what they're doing, they hate what they're doing. They love their friends, they don't like their friends. They, they shift really quick, right? Their attentions are, are quite limited. Um, but my parents, I think the best thing they did was, was keep us uh, committed to not doing the sport and not doing well in the sport, but just trying, focused on commitment, I guess, um, and perseverance. Uh, they also demanded a decent attitude. So attitude is something I think that is, we sometimes take it for granted. I guess teachers will say things like, well, watch that attitude. Be careful with that attitude. And we always think that's a negative thing. But it's interesting, there's a, a neuro, um, you know what I, he's a Holocaust survivor, um, uh, what was his name again? Um, Viktor Frankl, sorry, who said, and I'm gonna quote what he said, when all familiar goals of life are snatched away, what alone remains is the last of human freedoms, the ability to choose one's attitude in a given set of circumstances. So, Attitude is not something that you are born automatically having. You might, ha you might be born with a certain amount of optimism and you might have to work to become more optimistic by nature. But attitude is something you actually have to work on and, and practice and choose to wake up on the right side of the bed and get up and smile at the person next to you. And, and you know, there are differences in boys and girls in this, and I'm not gonna relate everything I say today um, to boys and girls and the difference in our genders, because it, it is sometimes, it's just a human being thing, you get up and you're grumpy, and you need to go and smile at someone to get that contagious smile to get back to you, right? It's so hard for people, if you smile at someone, they don't look at you with a grumpy face typically. They look at you and smile back. They, don't, they might think you're a bit nuts, but they don't know why they're smiling at you, but it makes you internally feel better. I mean, there's been experimental, uh, there have been experiments done with pens in people's teeth. So the muscles that are required for smiling make chemicals in your body, or they release endorphins in your body. So there were times when I would go to the back stretch and I remember this in 94 at the Olympics, the black and white 
vision that was in the video, I remember going to the back stretch and smiling, and I'm, I'm sure the people in the stands watching would have thought, what is she thinking about? What's she doing? But I was so totally convinced that smiling made me better. It would make me perform better. Um, and when I went to the line, they actually introduced me as Susan Ock from Milwaukee, Canada, so that kind of made me laugh. <laughs> um, the girl I was trying to beat, uh, she had set the fastest time before me. I was the last pair of the first seat in that race, and she's from Milwaukee, so it was uh, Bonnie Blair. But anyways, that, so there, you know, for whatever reason that you can get a child to smile, get them to smile. If, even if they're crying through tears, if you get them smiling, I think they, they, you, you just do better. I mean, I don't ever ask my kids before they go out to compete, um, you know, what, I sometimes ask them what you're going to think about, but I always end when I send them out with have fun. Having fun is, I just don't think any performance anywhere is sustainable without enjoyment. You might, you might get, there are talented people out there, and you might be able to bully and push and fight a child into performance, but it's not sustainable. You know, it'll, it'll be fleeting, they'll do it, they'll quit, they'll be done. I mean, how many times have you seen awesome athletes, and as activity leaders, you'll see this all the time, you'll see fantastic little talented athletes that just stop at some point, and you wonder why. Probably they weren't having fun. And why would you ever want someone to continue something if they're not having fun? So we need to find fun ways for kids to be active. I am veering way off my talk now, but um, so anyways, a attitude is a huge thing. We can all affect attitude. I think uh, we have to practice it all the time. Um, you know, one of the things I say to kids when I speak to them is, is try crossing your arms the normal way. Everybody do this. Cross your arms. Just cross them naturally. Now try to switch. It's, it takes a little bit of practice. Some people are good at it. For all of you people who are automatically good, how many people could do it automatically? And how many think they'd have to practice to be good at doing it automatically? Yeah, so it's, you do need to practice things to be good at it, and attitude is one of those things that practice makes perfect. So, you know, when you wake up one day and you feel dread-filled, because that happens, you have kind of, you know, especially when it's, well, this weather can sometimes do that, you have to practice being, having a good attitude so that the people around you will also have a good attitude. It's contagious. Good attitudes are definitely contagious. So I went on to, uh, um, obviously that opened the door, my dad opened the door, I um, always wanted to be a long track skater because it was in the Olympics. Short track was not in the Olympics, but I was better at short track. I was not a, an early developer, I was one of the kids that wasn't super strong, um, I was a pure sprinter, so all the races in speed skating are long for me, so I had to do all of my race at the beginning of the race. So I ended up being a pretty good short track skater. I got relegated to um, the short track team for the Canada Games uh, in 1983. And um, be just because I was better at short track and you know I could have been on the long track team too, but I was better at short track. Still wasn't an Olympic sport. I went there, I competed, I did great, and uh, the president came up to me and said, the president of Quebec speed skating at the time came up to me and said, stick with short track, it's going to be in the Olympics in 1988. And that, that opened another door for me, right? So you can uh, impact just by the small words you, you say, and I, I think about this all the time now. I'm at speed skating meets and I see someone that nobody's paying attention to and I see them race their race, they finish, and something stri strikes in my head that is interesting or good about that kid, I'll go tell them. They, we impact them by words we say all the time. Everyone around these kids impacts them. So don't be afraid to say those things. Get activated and get other people around you activated at just saying what you think you want to say to someone. It's never going to hurt. Maybe don't be critical, but if it's a positive thing, say it. it. It really does impact them. So that changed my direction. That was 1983. 
I made the national team in short track in 1984. I went to three world championships between 84 and 88. I spent one year still really trying to make the long track team. I just was desperate to try to make this long track team. I just wasn't strong enough for outside skating. Um, but what short track gave me was, you make the short track team in Canada and you are expected to perform internationally. I mean, Canadians are at the top of the world in short track and speed skating. We, we put it, we made it become international. Canada introduced it to the world um, and it became an international sport and probably the reason speed skating Canada really has survived um, and excelled to this date is because of short track. So we brought, we convinced the ISU to take it to the Olympic level and it was a demonstration sport in 88 and I was fortunate enough to make that team. I learned to be a champion. I learned to expect to win from short track. I didn't love the head-to-head -head racing. I was a bit afraid. I was tall for short track and um, had some fear. And so while I did it, I was really scared of falling and those blades are sharp. So. You know, I did it. Uh, I didn't have a ton of fun living in Montreal. I wasn't friends with any of the skaters on the team. And so that impacted me and I made the decision to switch. I uh, decided to quit skating. Um, I went away from an A card at the time, uh, Sport Canada Karting, and made the move to Calgary and thought, okay, well, I can go to university and try long track at the same time. The oval was indoor then. I had uh, qualified for a half a D card, which was like $119 a month in those days. Um, and, uh, but I got a Petro Canada scholarship and that encouraged me to go to school full time and I tried long track again. And something about the, well, just the shorter race, right? It's about four seconds shorter indoors than outside. I don't have to combat the wind and the snow and the uphill ice, you know, everything that's hard about outdoor skating in, in Winnipeg um, was not hard about outdoor skating in Calgary. And I all of a sudden just started excelling. Now that year, it was an interesting year. It was in 1989, I went onto the women's team. Um, I had some problems, went and trained with the men's team, which was a huge learning experience for me. It was the best thing that could have ever happened to me, um, but, but they weren't taking women to World Cups that year. Only the men got to go to World Cups that year because we had a huge cut in our budget, which always happens after Olympic Games. And it, it fully fueled my kind of fire. I was so irritated by it. It bothered me so much that just by gender, they decided who they were paying to go to World Cups. I. Um, decided that I was going to make it to the World Championships and I was going to be the best skater in, from Canada at those World Championships, like I could control that somehow, but it just fueled me on. Um, and you know what was really interesting was going to those World Championships, and, and girls can be kind of cruel, I, I remember walking into that rink in Holland and in Holland there are like 15,000 people screaming, drunk, 15,000 Dutch people who this is hockey to them, right? It's the sport of the country. Um, I remember first of all walking in there and thinking, oh my goodness, these women are like Amazons. How am I ever going to compete with them? And uh, second, I had some of the Americans come to me and I, girls just get competitive immediately and this girl came to me and said, oh, you're paired with one of the Dutch girls. It's gonna be an impossible race for you. They're gonna be screaming. And I remember going to the line and thinking to myself, wow, who, this, like I have a whole lane to myself. I have five meters where no one can come close to me. In short track, you're all on a five meter track, right? All of you together going around a 25 meter corner as opposed to a hundred meter corner. Like corners were easy for me. So. It's, you know, perspective is a huge thing for us and, and we don't always have to believe the people beside us that say these things to us that, you know, can throw you off. And I think we really need to teach kids that same thing. So when I, you know, when I hear my kids come home with so-and-so said something and I just think I try to talk to them about you don't have to believe everything everybody says around you, including sometimes your coach. Like your coach is really, and this I would, 
I would encourage all of you to be secure enough in your leading and coaching to actually tell your athletes and your, whoever you're guiding in your sport that you as a coach can't know everything about them because you're coaching a group of people and you're not inside their body or their head and so they need to speak up and they need to decide for themselves and they need to be able to ask you questions and if you don't know those answers you can't say oh you, you don't need to know that what you have to say is I will find out for you and I'll come back because what happens when coaches tell athletes I, you know what you don't need to worry about that it's sort of telling them you know what my way or the highway I, what I tell you to do, do it blindly and don't ask questions about it. And that is not the right, the right, I mean, really, from my perspective, that is not the right way to be. You want to empower your athletes. You want to make them accountable for what they do. They need to know what works for them. And it's always going to be different. It doesn't matter, you know, if we have a gold medal profile, which is kind of a, a thing right now, um, or a tracking next-gen athlete. It's it's not the same for every kid. There are no two kids that are going to be identical. And it's, you know, for me as the CEO of Speed Skating Canada now, um, I'm a little, you know, I'm at arm's length from the sports side of it. Um, but we have to put this into our system. We have to say that it is diverse and that all people um, progress at different rates. Uh, girls are not all lumped into that one category of girls and boys are not lumped into that one category of boys. And then there's the in-between. So we can't say this is the one tracking gold medal profile. So as coaches, I would really encourage you all to be, to encourage diversity in your athletes. They're going to progress at different rates, they're going to do different things. And some of them are going to complain and some of them are going to be excited. But what we want to do is keep them all in sport. That's the goal, right? So we have to not cater to them and help them become entitled because that's, that's different. We want to help them become accountable for themselves. So um, I became accountable for myself after that World Championships. I did place the highest of any of the Canadians there. I was sixth in the 500 and, and it opened my mind to the fact that, hey, I can Actually, I'm within shooting distance of the podium. Uh, this was 1989, and, and the Olympics were again in 1992 in Albertville. And um, so I went home, and I sat down with my coach, and I worked backwards. What time would I have to get indoors? So I could only compare it to Calgary ice, even though the Olympics were going to be outside in Albertville. But I went backwards, kind of the same as what you would do in a sales pipeline in business. You go, you figure out what you need to get, at the end and then you work your way backwards on how you get to get to that time that's why setting goals first a dream and then setting goals for your athletes is super super important you have to set these attainable goals backwards so you know for me in sport I look at how many medals do I want to win say at the next Olympics how many medals do I want speed skating Canada to win say it's four how many athletes do I need at that games in contention to win medals? Do I need for them to convert to four medals? And then how many athletes do I need on the national team in order to get to that conversion? You go backwards the whole way. For an athlete, you go, you figure out what the times are and you work backwards. And, and I mean, there, there are structured ways to do that by percentages. It's how we do all of our selection criteria for sport. Um, they have to be super well thought out in order for them to be attainable, those goals. Um, so I sat down and figured that out and I knew I needed to do, a, I think it was a 39.8 at the Oval um, in order to be on the podium in Albertville. Yet, you know, it was interesting. I was still really afraid to totally commit to my goals. I, um, and fear is one of those, I mean, it's something that really does get in your way. And, uh, you know, I, Mike Spracklin, actually, who <laughs> you would know, um, uh, said, and I'll just look for his quote here, fear is simply our body's way of telling us that we care about the outcome. And so it is, it's one of these things that when you get nervous, you feel this 
it's uncomfortable, super uncomfortable, we try to get away from it, but it's actually the thing that has made human beings the top of the heap. We have evolved to, I mean, we have nothing, Canada anyways, we have nothing, you know, nobody's chasing us, nobody's shooting at us, we don't have dinosaurs trying to eat us. We don't have a reason to use that evolutionary response of fear to get us somewhere. So we do dangerous things like sport or more dangerous things. But, and it is the thing that is gonna make you different from, train, from practice to performance. It's the one difference maker for an athlete. So you have to get them to somehow embrace their fear. I remember being at a World Cup in, in Japan, and this was even before Albertville, I think. I, was at a World Cup, it was just beautiful. It was sunny outside, 18 degrees. They had compressors so we could skate in 18 degrees outside without the ice melting, it was beautiful. And I remember being on the ice thinking about the trials coming up in two weeks in Winnipeg, in uh, Calgary, and just feeling like I was gonna throw up. And I just felt like, oh my God, I gotta get away from this. And we lose a lot of athletes for that fear, right? We lose kids who are afraid of um, facing their competitors and for girls, especially, the fear of what's everybody going to think if I don't win, right? It's uh, girls worry about what other people think a lot more than boys do. And for me, I was the best skater at that time on the Canadian team, but I was worried at the trials that I might not win. And I was thinking about it at a World Cup two weeks earlier, which was just ludicrous. I, I remember going to the bathroom and I... I started thinking, okay, I have to get my brain busy. Like, I really have to get busy. And I, I work with this a lot now because we have a horse property and you have to do this with horses or they start looking for things to spook at. You get their brain busy. You get them busy doing something. But it's the same in human beings. You get them busy. You get, I got my brain busy thinking about technical things. So I got really, really good at thinking about one or two pre- prepared um, thoughts. So for me, it was super long, super low, and powerful. And in the video, you could see the difference in my aggression versus Katrina's. I had to be super aggressive all the time. I had to push myself. I wasn't naturally super aggressive. So it's, uh, I, I ended up um, surviving that World Cup and doing okay there, and then doing the trials a couple weeks later. But I, I got in the habit of figuring out how to combat my nerves by using my nerves as a cue to think about something technical. So if you try to, and like there are so many advantages to that, it seems like such a simple thing and there are a lot of athletes who do it just naturally, right? You just, they, they get nervous and they start thinking about something they have to do so that they can combat being nervous because it is uncomfortable. It's not a comfortable feeling. Um, but if you find yourself, and I do this now in every, sort of level of my life. If I get nervous, I start thinking about something technical that I can control and start visualizing that technical thing. And it's hard to teach. I try and teach it with my kids. It's not always best being a coach if you're the mom. So they sometimes take my advice and I hope they hear it, they fight it. I have teenagers and you know the, the saying of hug the monster, so hug the fear. I feel like I'm hugging the monster sometimes with my children because they're kind of, they don't like me that much anymore. But I think they hear me. I believe they hear me. I have to believe that all the time and I just keep saying it and I keep role modeling it. Um, but nerves is one of those things. If we can combat nerves, if we can teach our athletes to love being nervous. I got to the point where if I wasn't nervous at a World Cup, I got worried that I wasn't going to do well. And I literally didn't do as well. So World Cups started not being important enough for me. I had to be in Olympic Games to really have that adrenaline shoot out of me. So um, that I got through that. I got through... Um, learning how to compete at an Olympic level. But when I went to Albertville, I, we had been asked before we went um, by the media, and everybody always wants to know, well, what's your goal? What is your hard goal? And I said top five, or top six, I think. And guess what place I was? Does anybody want to? <laughs> yeah, so you are going to be what you, what, you, what you aim at. And why? who in the world, what athlete in the world would aim 
at fourth, fifth, or sixth at the Olympics. There is not an athlete in the world, even if that's all they're capable for, of, that would aim at that. I mean, fourth is hard, right? Sixth was fun for me, for sure. Um, but I finished the race and realized I could have won a medal, for sure. I looked at the three women who won medals there and thought, oh, I should have I aimed at a medal. So you have to really set your, set your goals high, and you have to let your athletes set them high without giving them fear of, don't get your hopes up. We hear that a lot, right? Don't get your hopes up. Don't tell your athletes that. Tell them to get their hopes up. The worst that can happen is they get disappointed. It's hard to watch our children get disappointed, for sure. But disappointment in not aiming high enough is way worse than disappointment in not getting there. I can promise you that. I mean, I, I think back to, you know, I let my kids get out of things once in a while just to see how they feel when they sat there and watched the thing that they could have been doing and see people who they could have been competing against do really well at whatever it is that they get out of. I've, it's, uh, so if that doesn't make sense to you, I, I remember watching these two girls in Minneapolis at a speed skating meet. They decided to not do the mass start race at the end. And the moms were just so mad and I, I just said, just let them get out of this. It's not the end of the world for them to miss this. But they have their competitors skating and let's see how they do. And they did really well. So these two girls sat there and I went and talked to them after and I said, so do, do you wish you did it now? And they were both like, yeah kind of kicking ourselves. We wish we had done it, right? So girls especially. So the, the thing that Joanne Deke said at Belmora Hall was, so for boys, they don't have connectedness automatically. We need to teach them connectedness. So animals are really important. Um, groups, getting them connected to something is super important for boys. For girls, getting confidence at something makes them confident. They already are born, you know, and I'm generalizing, most girls are born with connectedness. So we need to kind of push them over the hill, not throw them in the deep end in a pool when they're not ready, but get them to face their fears. And you know, I, I, I have so many examples of me and my parents and me hating my mom for making me do something that, you know, she was so shy, so she would never go up and ask for something. She forced me to go ask for it. And then I'd feel exhilarated after, right? And I look at my children and I think the same thing. Like I have one, I have twins. Uh, one of them is quite good at short track. The other one, not as much. She just did not want to skate this year. And the coach convinced her I didn't do any of it. And, and she, a couple weeks ago, she was, I didn't want to have to go to two ice sessions. So I made her skate on the more advanced ice session. She was crying on the way to skating. and. I just, it was more out of, I just didn't have time to wait there for two hours, so I, I pushed her into the higher level and she was capable and she was so excited after because I pushed her. It's not the worst thing to push children for, you know, you have to make sure that the motivation isn't that you are worried about how they do because I don't, you know, at the end of the day, the experiences they get from sport are way more important than how they do in sport. It's, for me, this is, an, uh, as we have on our website, Speed Skating Canada, an apprenticeship for life. It, my, my results in sport were awesome. I was lucky, super, super fortunate. But they were fleeting. What I get out of it now is that I can influence and inspire and I am the CEO of an NSO, which in my wildest dreams, I never thought I could do this kind of job. But I have the kind of guts to go ahead and do it, which often the reason that men are in these high CEO positions um, isn't because they're better than women. It's because they have the guts to sort of jump into the deep end. They've said, yeah, sure. Sometimes they, and excuse my language, but um, maybe I won't say it, but they sometimes <laughs> Uh, exaggerate the truth a little and say, yeah, sure, I've done that before, I can do it. Women don't do that. They have to contemplate and think about and have proof that they can do this before they jump into the deep end. And we don't get the same opportunities often because we just don't go for them. 
It's not because they're not there for us to take, but we just don't go for them. I mean, I was, re I was asked once before to, to apply for a CEO position for a really great opportunity in Manitoba, and I was too chicken to go for it. But when this came up, and it was a bit in my comfort zone, obviously, because I know the sport technically, the challenge is you get a little too attached, you're a bit too invested in it, and it was really hard physically hard for me to let go of the reins and let my chief sport officer go with the sports side, right? I had to just, I hired him, I had to trust him to go. And truthfully, that is a hard thing to do if you're really technically um, in the know of something and you get an opportunity to lead the whole thing. I have to not micromanage, that's my biggest challenge. Um, but I went for it, and I think I'm doing a good job. I'll, I, you know, I have to, I'm not sure, but I hope I am. I assume I am. I'm going with my convictions, and I'm not regretting what I'm doing. So fear, we can't let fear stop us. We can't encourage kids to let fear stop them. Let them go for it. It's super, super important, more important to girls, for girls than for boys. So if you're coaching a group of kids and, um, you know, there's something scary to do. I don't, I don't know what it is, but uh, what sports are in the room here? I'm sure there's a sport that's scary. Is there a sport that's scary in here? Which? Yeah, okay, perfect example. So you have the boy going, let me at it, let me try. I want to see how high I can jump or how fall I can, or how far I can fall into those, you know, the, the things, the cubes that you fall into, the foam cubes. <laughs> <laughs> Those are kind of fun, right? I was always the fear chaser. I loved, I loved scary things, but, but I'm probably one of those 20% of girls that maybe didn't cry, so, or somewhere in between. I mean, we're not all in a category either. But I think, you know, you see the boy going for it, try to get the girl to follow the boy. And don't, you know, you don't want to enhance the different genders, obviously. You just want them all to be going in a pack together. I mean, it's, it's almost, you know, I don't know, you hear these sayings, right? Play like a girl. And I, I think, you know, it's, you get kind of offended at that. I, I sort of feel offended sometimes when I hear that, but I kind of want to be proud of that. Play like a girl, be tough, go for it. Be finesse filled and technically great. So when I thought about how I could combat those Amazons in Holland, I could never be as strong physically as them, but I could be smarter and I could be more technically perfect. And that's just my body makeup, right? So three things that are important in most sports is your brain, how you compete, your physical attributes, whether you're lucky or not. And for sure, I had a lot of luck in my physiology. I had fast twitch. I have muscles that can do high performance power sports. I, um, and I, I could, I had kinesthetic sense, so I learned how to move my body and become technically great. But I was never gonna be the strongest girl out there. I mean, I could never be, Katrina would walk by a weight room and get big. I would walk by the weight room, I'd walk out of the weight room, and I'd lose all the work I did. Like, it just wasn't, you know, Katrina had muscle. She was super strong, and but more afraid of racing. So we had our different attributes. Um, but in the end, you, you know, I was, I was lucky, and I think, I think that we have to, have to think of how we personally can help the kids with their, they don't have to be good at everything. They don't all have to be the physiologically best athletes, but they can try to be better in their brains. Um, so I'm all over the place here. <laughs> this is a different kind of talk than I normally give about girls, and I'm kind of passionate about it. Um, but uh, I went on then and, and went uh, to the Lillehammer Olympics and, and I remember thinking there, watching the other women in my group, so you're out there with your own group that you're going to be racing with at the games, you're, you're warming up with that group and I remember, so I had this this cue that said every time I got nervous I was thinking about something technical so my brain automatically went to something that was going to help me in my race, right? So I was going to be low, I was going to be super long, I was going to be powerful and I watched all these women falling apart the day before the races or the day before the 500 and I remember thinking, okay, I'm going to be the one who survives because I can combat my nerves because here 
there's no more training that's going to help me win. There's no more technical ability that's going to help me win. What's going to help me win is knowing I can do it and just taking all of the nerves I have in me and, and racing that race. And, and I was lucky enough to get to that finish line and, and I remember seeing my brother in the stands here and he was just jumping around. He was sitting with Katrina's family who was sad because Katrina had fallen in the race. And Katrina and I were teammates all the way through our career from day one till we both, well, till I retired. And it, it is not always hard. So this is something I, I wish Speed Skating Canada had done a little bit more with, um, is the, the female team relationship. Uh, when we went to, when we were getting ready to go to Nagano, to the Olympics in 1998, um, our coach, I had had knee surgery the year before, so I was recovering all of 97 from, uh, I had quad, a quad tendon that ruptured. It was called jumper's knee, so alpine skiers get it a lot, but in those days they can't just, they didn't just go in with, you know, something small. They actually cut my knee open, uh, they re-injured it, they spliced the tendon, they drilled into my kneecap and made it bleed, and it was to re-recover re it, because when I had done it the first time, I didn't get proper care. I didn't recover it properly. It's so much more advanced now. This would never happen in this day and age, but it happened back then. And so I spent all of 97, the only time in my whole skating career, because I started my career in short track where I was expected to win. It was the only year in my whole skating career where I got to just kind of enjoy it. <laughs> there was no pressure to win. I was recovering from knee surgery, but in my brain, I never, there was no risk. I wasn't going to get back on the podium. I assumed I'd hear the Canadian anthem again in Nagano and the challenge was my our coach uh, was fired the year before the Olympics and he was the coach that um, coached me in Lillehammer it was devastating to me um, this stuff happens in sport all the time uh, but uh, Katrina had really come a long ways she was winning World Cups that year that I was enjoying myself and recovering from knee surgery and the, co the only coach around to coach the, the national sprint team was my brother. So this was going to be a big challenge. So my brother was expected to coach the five best male sprinters in the world. Almost, like there were maybe six. And, you know, someone from Japan was, was better. And the two, well, and at the time nobody really had tons of hope in me. I did, but other people didn't see it. Um, and two of the best skaters, in, women skaters in the world, sprinters in the world. And so it was, you know, at first uh, the whole team started gravitating towards Derek. Uh, Katrina stayed with the long distance group. I needed Katrina. I needed to chase somebody. I needed to be training with one of the fastest people in the world. So I went to Cal Botterill, who most of you probably know, and, and I asked him to work with our team to try to just figure out how we were all going to work together to bring Katrina in to, I asked him to go get her and bring her into the group, and, and how were we going to function in that year. So Cal had us all on a table, and he did this round table thing of, you know, what can you give to the team, and what do you need from the team. And it was interesting because Katrina and I said almost the same thing. We, we both needed encouragement. I'd never really had a team around me. We'd, I was the only skater that was really performing high and just assumed I could do it all. But when you get injured, you realize you need a team around you. You cannot do it at all by yourself. Um, and we both thought we could probably contribute a little more, be less selfish on the team. And so that was a big sort of um, letting our guard down for a moment. We were friends, but not you know the best of friends, and we were always competitors. And we had a we had a great coach, the one that was fired, that just was a no crap coach. Like he just did not let us buy into any of the competitiveness that can happen on the ice. Katrina and I never competed on the ice. That was key. Um, I think a lot of athletes they get on into their training programs and they actually compete in training, which kills you. You don't do the program properly if you're competing in training. 
We never competed in training. We did exactly the right times. We had other people passing us all the time, and we, they were nowhere near as fast as us. So, you know, I felt confident letting that happen with Katrina, and she felt confident because I was that way too. And so in that meeting, we, we made a pact with the men and the women in the sprint team that we were always going to cheer each other on in training. We were going to... And there, and there was actually one of, the, one of the slides that went across that said uh, something about the same, on the same lines that, oh, Katarina Witt, I think, said, uh, so our agreement was that we were always going to cheer each other on and we were then going to try to be better. So there was no <laughs> trying to knock somebody down, right? Not trying to one-up each other by pushing somebody down, but we were going to one-up each other by climbing up. So we were always going to try to... I wanted Katrina do, to be her best, and then I was going to try to be better than her. And so we went, it was really, really hard to do. I can tell you, I mean, it was in training to actually loudly, you know, it started off pretty quiet. I'd be, good job, Katrina. You know, it was really hard, right? And same thing for her. And uh, we went to um, the first World Cup. She, I think, won the first race, and I won the second race, which was pretty awesome. It was the only World Cup she lost, so, you know, she was really good that year. She went on to clap skates and was the, the person to chase. I was lucky enough to have her in my country and to get to skate with her every day. She was lucky to have me in that I was fearless. I was a racer. I could, you know, make us unafraid of racing the world. and. And we went to the Olympics. Uh, I remember the day before the race and I was struggling a little bit with corners. The ice was super, super hard and being not aggressive, if you don't push into the ice, it's sometimes hard to grip. And so Derek had Katrina to lead uh, an acceleration. It's like a zero to 100% um, over 225 meters or so. And we did this, and we were in perfect unison. I mean, we skated together all the time and for 17 years before, or 15 years before that. So um, we got back to my brother, and he was just electric. He's like, everyone in this building is looking for third place now. They don't think they have a chance next to you and Katrina. And sure enough, it turned out the Olympic race day, um, the first race, so there were two 500s at this Olympics. The Little Hammer Olympics were still just one 500 on fixed blades, so, and leather boots, very different. This Olympics was two 500s back to back, like one day after the other, um, which was hard for me being a pure sprinter. I really, I did well, really well in the first 500. I was four 100s behind Katrina, and then the second one, you saw the race, and we went to the line. We finished, I started out really fast, finished that race, I thought, great, and we came first and second. First time Canadians were on the podium together at the Olympics. Um, and it was entirely because we worked together. None of that would have happened. I don't know if even one of us would have been on the podium. The Germans were as good as us, but they were always fighting with each other. I mean, you could see the fighting they did with each other. And, we were, we were strong and we were successful. We were two Canadians on the podium because we one-upped each other positively. We never one downed each other. And I think this is more important in girls' sport than boys' sport even. Our men were second, third, fourth, and fifth at that Olympics in the 500. Ross Rebegliati competed the same day, so nobody remembers that. <laughs> um, but they were second and third on the podium too. Uh, and you know, I think that it was that success at that Olympics was purely teamwork resulting. It was entirely from teamwork. So, you know, when you have girls, don't cater to the, the fighting and the, you know, often when you have two strong women, like Katrina and I both were, one will try to push the other one down. And we went through many, many years where we were, you know, really just supporting each other. I mean, we had moments, for sure, there were times where it was difficult, but um, don't let them, what girls typically do to bully is, is the strong, one of the strong girls will surround herself with a whole bunch of other girls and push the next strongest girl out, right? That's, and it's really hard to identify. I don't think it's easy to see. For men, like, when they bully, 
they they don't they're just out loud mean right they can just they say it and it's done and that's hard too but for girls it's subtle it's super secretive like they're and it happens in the workplace it happens for your whole life as a woman right so just be careful of that watch it and pay attention to it don't cater to it like don't separate them make them work together put them together and make them both be leaders the two top girls and there's always going to be two top girls in a group i mean i can tell you there's always going to be that alpha girl that is competing with the other alpha girl and that's not a bad thing we don't want to squash that because we want them to go on and be leaders in the world right so we were lucky teamwork was huge my brother it was a super big challenge to have my brother coach my teammate to win a gold medal <laughs> while I win the silver. And that's the, the you know, I'd say if you have, um, if there's a message out of that, make sure that the, the goals are very specific. Saying I wanted to hear the Canadian anthem on the podium wasn't quite enough. Because who would have known my teammate would win the gold medal and I'd get to hear it from the silver medal position. So. <laughs> Anyway, I, I think there are a lot of messages in this. I think I'd like to, I don't know what time it is right now, but oh, geez, I'm past my time. Um, I would love to take some questions if anybody has any. I uh, have talked longer than I planned to talk, but it's kind of a passionate subject for me. So um, yeah, I, to finish off, I'd just say just always encourage, 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 and not to win, but be happy and have fun and, and be a good teammate. Does anybody have any questions for me? Did I say enough? <laughs> not one question? Yes? So you're a competing individual, so if you take that in for four person four four team sport to create that team chemistry to drive each other, well, short track, you are a team, and in long track, I mean, you're, you're a team that we have to train together all the time. You never are alone in your training, right? We follow each other. You've seen the trains of skaters following each other in long track. Um, I guess, you know, in a, in a team of four, we have those challenges with the pursuit in long track and in the relay and short track. Um, you, it's the same thing. You have to challenge your your teammates to be the best that they can be at whatever part they play in that team because not all of the team is going to be the leader of that team, right? So there, there are sometimes there's a leader, sometimes there's a person who just keeps the team together and they're the middle person. And then there's sometimes the one that comes up on the rear and, you know, has to, has to go fast but not necessarily skate away. I mean, we saw this happen at the Olympics in the the Koreans team in the pursuit, the speed skating pursuit, I don't know if anybody remembers this, but um, our team had come up with, uh, and our, our women who raced there, they were nowhere near as good as they placed. I mean, they were fourth, but uh, you know, I'd say they were probably the sixth or seventh best team. And so they did place really well. The Koreans could probably have won. They had some of the best skaters, but they didn't help each other at all. We, our girls and, and our men, so our women and our men, um, would, when in the pursuit, you start off with your fast person, so your sprinter type starts the race. It's an eight lap race. Uh, there's three people that do it. You all have to cross the line together. Uh, the last place person, or the last person to cross the line is when the time stops. And the second person is kind of your powerhouse. The third person is the long distance person. So sometimes your sprinter person or the person who is fast off the start falls off the back, right? So what our teams have done, and these are, these are secrets, so you can't tell the rest of the world. We push our, our um, sprinter person back into the middle and then w the powerhouse in the middle of the thing helps, uh, actually pushes them physically keeps their hand on them to keep them going forward. And it's, it, it, so our team crossed the line all together. The Koreans, they skated away from their, their person who started the race. And there was like national drama about this. The girl that, that didn't win the medal in the end, the Korean that skated away, was just ridiculed, which as a country, it was kind of cool that they came up to support the weak person, the person who got left behind. Um, you know, I think, I think you have to just, I, 
I'm not a team, per, I, did, I never ever competed on a team, so that's a hard question for me, but I think you would, you would just keep on encouraging that one upmanship and, and then try to be your best. So you try to push the person, your teammate, to be stronger. You're constantly trying to push your teammates to be stronger and then you want to be the best. And if you have to make a team, you have to just have faith that if you've done the right stuff, that you're going to be the one chosen. Does that help at all? <laughs> Anybody else? All right, well, thank you for having me here. This was fun for me. I'm, I'm going to develop this talk a little bit more, including my CEO part and future leadership with, uh, with you know, the gender subject is a big one right now in sport, and in our sport, we have to figure that out for sure. Um, but thank you for this opportunity, and uh, good luck with all of your future coaching.